Welcome back to Think Tech here at the five o'clock block on a given Thursday. Our last live show of the week, although we do broadcast overnight and we will always do that. Uh, and we have Dave Douglas here on, um, I guess you call it uh, Think Tech Tech Talks. And we're talking about Silicon Valley because we discovered in the course of a, a show on cafe, cafe restaurants, a, a few, I guess last week, was it? Yeah, I think um, it was last week, yeah. Found that not only is he a restaurateur, but he is a, um, a, a former member of the community of technology people in Silicon Valley. <laughs> And we said, oh, God, we got to talk to him. We got to get a, you know, peep through the keyhole and see through Dave what Silicon Valley was and is about. So welcome to the show, Dave. Thank you, Jay. It's, I hope it's not a distorted view that I, that I give you. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I was there kind of in the early days, or at least what I called the early days. And uh, pretty amazing. Um, I didn't even know what I was involved in at first. But, uh, but yeah, it was pretty cool as, as, I, as time rolled on. Um, it was pretty neat, and I realized that I was really in the middle of something that was going to change the world. Ah, change the world, nothing less. This is why <laughs> I was telling you I enjoy so much uh, Halt and Catch Fire, um, oh, exactly. which is yeah. a serial on, I guess, Netflix, and you have seen it too. And it yeah. just, it, it just I, I surrendered to that serial. It was so interesting because, because it, was a, um, it plugged you in to what happened. In, in around 1980, 82, 83, yeah. um, about the development of uh, hardware and software, the PC essentially, and all the clones that came out uh, and how the world changed and how Silicon yeah. Valley became Silicon Valley um, to develop things, as you say, that changed the world. So why yeah. did you go there? What did you do there? What kind of experience did well, you have? It was kind of, for me, Silicon Valley was like falling off a log. I, I didn't even really know what I was doing. So I, um, in when I was in high school, I was one of those kids who scored really well on the aptitude tests and did great on my SATs, ACTs, but my, my grades were horrible. <laughs> so I could get in, and I grew up in Oklahoma to make matters even worse. So I could get into um, an Oklahoma university uh, because I pretty much knew how to spell my name correctly, but I wasn't <laughs> going to get into anything like even Michigan. Or I just I wasn't going to get into a university that I thought I'd really like to go to. So in my infinite wisdom, I joined the Marine Corps, <laughs> which again, don't ask me why, but I, I joined the Marine Corps. And in that, um, I actually started working on satellites and radar, which was very cool. And so before I got out, about six months, seven months before I got out, there was this uh, these recruiters from Silicon Valley came down, basically from Lockheed and General Dynamics and those folks, and uh, they came down and, and offered me a job. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to move up to Silicon Valley when I get out. And, um, and I worked in the uh, defense industry for about six months and realized it just wasn't what, I didn't want to do that. Uh, there, uh, I would see the same, these old guys, like really old guys, like 37. And uh, oh, that's old. Coffee, you know, yeah, they had the coffee, and I was like, "Man, you're just like Gunny Hatfield, you know." Or I would just be, <laughs> it would just be like, "This is the Marine Corps, but no, no saluting and and no, you know, uh, rifles and camouflage." But it was the same thing, and I, I just didn't want that. I, I, I knew I just didn't want to do thirty years or twenty years of that. So I ended up stumbling into. Um, a small startup company called Daisy Systems that no one even really knows about today, but they were like the pioneer of electronic design automation. And, and some of the most brilliant people that I've ever met, folks that I looked up to and we'll never meet again. I'll never meet these, these folks again, especially when they were young, like um, Vinod Kosla, who was one of the founders of Daisy Systems and he and Arya Feingold I'll, I'll just put it politely. They, they got into a, a difference of opinion. And uh, Vinod was like, I'm going to go start my own company. And I was like, well, good luck. I, you know, wish you luck. And uh, so Vinod went off and started this little company called Sun Microsystems. Oh, no. <laughs> so, oh, gosh. So, I mean, and these, 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 I say guys, men and women, they were just stellar. And I looked up to them. And so, and this was 1982. So what was weird about, um, uh, halt and and again that was a command. Well, halt, when you, halt when you said, and catch yeah, fire, yeah. Yeah, when you said halt and catch fire, I said, "What did you just say?" Because that was that wasn't actually a command; it was a computer command. And in the intro of every every episode, it kind of shows this this chip burning up, and it was more facetious, kind of like a kind of like a military phrase, like snafu, you know, situation normal, all you know what, 
or, or FUBAR, um, it was kind of um, halt and uh, catch fire was very much kind of a, a play on it's the bus really isn't going to catch fire the, the 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 chip isn't going to run so hot that it just explodes but that's pretty much what it meant it just said take it to acceleration and get that chip to be in a situation where you're not going to be able to recover from that and and so when you said that i was like what and uh and <laughs> or i mean when i first heard the the name of the title i was like what and but then i heard oh it's a it's a amc show and I was like, yeah, I don't really want to watch it. It's just going to be another one of the Silicon Valley. And I'm not going to like it because I was there. I lived it. I was there. And I just don't want to, I don't want to watch it. So I pushed it off for quite a while. And a few of my friends were like, dude, you got to watch this. Like they're talking about Comdex. I'm like, they're talking about Comdex. And <laughs> so, so I, I started watching it and I just got hooked. I got hooked and it was just really cool because, and I'll tell you, it, it in that show, so you remember a character by the name of Joe. This guy was kind of Joe a McMillan. Guy. He was kind of a cross between Steve Jobs and a million other people, but he yes. had a lot of jobs in him. Yeah. But there was one episode, I don't remember which one it was, but it was later in the season. And Joe was all excited about this new thing called the World Wide Web. And he said, I went to CERN and I and I talked to Tim Berners Lee, and there's this thing. And I got, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I got goosebumps because they took that, that situation and applied it to the character named Joe. That situation happened to a guy I worked for, the president of Pantheon Interactive. His name was Kip Parent. If you look in the Digirati, he's listed as the webmaster in the Digirati. And Kip worked for Silicon Graphics at the time. And he went to CERN. And he talked to Tim Berners-Lee and he came back. So they took a piece of history that of some from someone that really happened and applied it to a person in the in the show. And man, I was like, oh my God, I identified with Joe. Um, and I I actually identified with every single character at one point or another throughout my career. Um, even even uh, Cameron, who was the you know the really awesome um, S hot. We used to say the word S hot. Um, expletive hot and uh that meant you're a great programmer like you're a great engineer you're an s hot engineer and in the in the show she was an s hot engineer and and i identified with her because when i was younger i kind of thought i was too i, I wasn't now that i look back but i thought i was but uh, but uh, the show was very interesting because it really did track silicon valley from about 1982 um until i don't know when early 90s maybe um and some of the timelines did skew a little bit, but for the most part, it was just a brilliant show and amazing characters. And they did pull from history. They pulled from real life, you know, like Mark Andreessen. I remember meeting Mark Andreessen in Netscape. And then when Yahoo got in on the bar and it, it all the other browsers were dead, it was like, oh, that's it. Or not browsers, but the search engines, it's like, well, over. And then later Google comes along <laughs> and just knocked Yahoo out of the water. So just a, just a very interesting wild ride all, all the way around. Yeah, you know, I, when I watched it, I, I I was on the outside looking in, but I remember a lot of these developments and um, the markers of, of the serial. I said, yeah. you know, it's just as you say, these these may not have been real people, but these were real personalities, and they yes. were real, you know, efforts, real companies, real entrepreneurial activities. And although yeah. the time frame may be a little bit off, I I saw that as a very good study of how probably the most important innovative experience the country has ever seen took place. What an amazing place to be in and, and to enjoy for all those yeah. episodes. Yeah. I thought it was neat and, and not to be um, elitist or weird or anything, but we actually thought Comdex was like, and eh, that's like, that's the consumer show. You know, we, the, when I was with Daisy Systems, we were in this, this, um, uh, industry, if you will, or this segment called uh, electronic design automation. And you had um, Daisy Systems and Mentor Graphics and Valid Logic, and it was called the DMV sector, if you will. And we were total pioneers. So Daisy, um, in, engineers from Intel came to Daisy and they got, uh, Daisy was funded by Fred Adler. I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but, but, but like a pioneer again in venture capital. And um, uh, later, I was with the company that got got funded by Draper Fisher Jorvetson. And uh, yeah, so I mean, all these names, you know, I would kind of hear them throughout the series. But uh, but Daisy had some amazing folks that came 
out of DAISY and amazing companies that were sprung from DAISY systems. So Sun Microsystems, Synoptics, um, Cadence, all these amazing companies, at uh, Xilinx, these companies that came from there. And then you had uh, Silicon Valley who are now like Silicon Valley um, icons. And you may or may not know or recognize some of these names, but like Harvey Jones and again, Vinod and just these folks that, that made a huge impact. And they all came from just this tiny little pioneering company called Daisy. And um, it was just, a, it was a way cool time. And, and again, Comdex was really very much more for the consumer, but there was this other conference called DAC or DAC. And DAC was, man, if you went to DAC and it was an IEEE conference, you know, the electronic engineering conference, man, you are cool. Like you, you were at DAC and you were changing the world and you're building these, these computers that were just like allowing the technology sector to just explode. And, and what we did, you know, DAISY systems, it actually kind of helped automate the creating PCB boards, which sounds really boring. But you could you could use this layout, and it would get get things so close and be able to tell like what the heuristics were like in terms of chips that would be made. And um, we would Daisy also would allow uh, the time to market to be shortened by not having to go to the foundry and get these wafer chips. So you'd 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 try and create a wafer uh, which would have a ton of chips on it, and then you'd have like an eighty percent failure rate or sixty or and Daisy systems by doing the this. Uh, this um, uh, logic that we would apply just, just to be through the computer, we would do this analysis and it would bypass a lot of having to go to foundry. And so all of a sudden after this industry got created, Intel and AMD and all these companies were just exploding these new chips that did things that were crazy, chips that would you would never imagine, but they, they, they could program them and be able to design them and test them and simulate how they're gonna work. And, and just time to market just got cut to a fraction. So it was pretty cool. It was really a neat industry. Well, it sounds like if you're, if you're in that industry, you really you have contact, you're rubbing elbows with a lot of people. You're, you're, you're tracking on the arcs of their careers and their successes yeah. and failures. You're tracking on the moves yeah. of these little companies, uh, merging, consolidating, failing, yeah. whatever it might be. Um, and it was a community, uh, I, I say was because maybe it still is, um, a community of individuals who were all like connected and, and watching each other across the street and trying yeah. to learn and, and sometimes were, doing dastardly things in order to succeed. Dastardly. You and saw there, all that. There was tons of competition. I mean, the comp and like it was loose lips sink ships. Like do not ever share an idea. You know, and if you do, it's going to be on a little napkin and you're just writing it out and you wad it up and throw it away. Like you just, you really kept your ideas very much to yourself because you would, and, and I mean, and with your tight little group. The thing that I think is kind of interesting though is at the time, I didn't know who these people were going to become. So like when I knew Guy Kawasaki, who was the first evangelist, the main evangelist coming out of Apple, I didn't really, I mean, Guy was Guy, you know, he was a cool guy and uh, smart as heck. And I remember seeing him at a conference like 25 years later and we were, I got a photo with him. I was like, dude, I got to get a photo. It's because we, before there was a photo at a conference and we were a lot thinner <laughs> and I think a lot prettier. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, but it was neat because I had no idea who Guy was going to become. Um, and so just rubbing elbows and meeting people and later on seeing, you know, seeing kind of where, you know, where they ended up and what they did. And, you know, I think I told you in a prior uh, conversation, I'd met Steve Jobs twice over the course of about 15 years. And, um, and his reputation did precede him. And he was very um, uh, kind of obnoxious. <laughs> is probably the nicest way to say it. <laughs> so, well, maybe, maybe, you know, and that certainly is the Joe McMillan character in. Uh, I, uh, yeah, in it was really funny because Joe McMillan, he was like kind of one, obviously one of the main characters. And I think he was one of the more developed characters because I did see um, in Silicon Valley, I saw folks that I knew, vent venture capital people, engineers, I saw them and I maybe myself too, if I look back, go through a, a certain level of metamorphosis, kind of a change. And, um, and, and you start getting older and you start getting wiser and you realize maybe you're not quite, you know, the world doesn't revolve around you. 
and your idea. Um, and so then collaboration starts becoming an important component of, uh, of moving forward. But, but when we were young, it was just, you know, stay up all night, eat pizza, and just code, 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 and work, 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 work. And uh, many a time, I, I, I pulled all-nighters to, just to get something out the door. Was that, was that the arc of your, your career and <clears throat> I suppose your success in Silicon Valley? Were you, yeah. were you a coder? Were you working on um, Well, you know, I started projects? out as, as in the technical side as an engineer and I actually was um, in electronic engineering. So I, I was analog and everyone was digital. Most people were digital. So I was pretty unique and there's only, you know, a few of us that had a really strong analog background. And uh, one of the first things we worked on um, that I was really proud to be just even have, have my hands on it, uh, even if it was a support situation, was this thing called Color Burst. And it was the, the first in that industry, the first color uh, uh, display graphics board that, that displayed color uh, because it used to be green on a black screen. So, so oh, well, I remember, color, yeah. Wow, like this is so amazing. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. So what, what kind of traits did it take you know, to succeed? It seems like you, know, you have to work hard. You have to have ideas. You have to have a lot of ideas. That was clear in the, in the series. You have to have sure. an idea every day. It has to be a remarkable idea. And yeah. as things get more complex, as the companies get more am, ambitious and, and larger, I suppose, and better, <laughs> better funded, um, you know, just one, as you said, one individual with one idea wasn't enough. You had to form teams. You had to collaborate. Yeah. And maybe sometimes you had to move to another group that was a better collaboration for you. I mean, it sounds pretty fluid, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was it was interesting because I think there were folks who um, kind of the idea makers, and then there were the builders, the folks who would kind of make it happen. And um, and I kind of straddled the fence a little bit uh, in the early days. I really just wanted to put my head down and and make things work, but then later. I found that I had a talent for seeing and in kind of into the future. I had a talent for being able to see technologies as it stood that day and where it could get to in, in a few months or six months or a year and being able to, to look at markets that we might be able to reach. Um, it's pretty easy to come up with, with cool ideas, but if the technology is not there to support it or if you're, if you're too ahead of the wave, then it's just not going to going to work. So to um, I'm lucky to have a, my name on a few patents. So that's kind of cool. Um, and uh, and I hit a lot. I was in a lot of different industries with regard to technology. Um, but I think starting out in the electronic des design automation, like that gave a lot of credibility. It's like, oh wow, you were you were there. So the compact folks, you know, if we go back to um, to the show, is the the Basically, the show in the very first season was about Compaq. Um, if you know Compaq Computers, it was basically sure. that was the company. They never really said it, but the Compaq was coming out with this, this uh, lunchbox or toolbox looking computer, which was just the coolest thing in the world. I mean, my gosh, to have a computer that was the size of a, of a toolbox or a tackle box um, and be able to literally pick it up and walk it somewhere and plug it in was unbelievably cool. And, uh, and so the show was really about um, Compaq and what they were doing in, out of Texas. And then it ended up migrating to, you know, what I call the proper Silicon Valley. Um, but, but it was interesting because these, these, uh, uh, these folks would have ideas and they would be cutting edge. But if you couldn't, if you couldn't get it to market, then all was lost. And so I kind of, in uh, what I realized was my talent really lied in being able to to see a market and be able to see it and 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 take whatever technology we have and be able to tweak it and turn it and twist it and and you know modify it a little bit and get it into that market and that's really kind of how I ended up. I was a, a strategy guy. I'd been CEO a few times and was with a couple of companies that went public and uh, sold a few companies myself uh, that I had started. But um, the last real job I had was um, as a I was head of global strategy. Uh, for a, a development company. And we worked with the likes of British Airways and American Airlines and uh, General Electric and Johnson Johnson and you know all these huge companies. And, but it, would, it was very much from a strategy perspective. How do they take their 
uh, and a little bit of change management, but how do they take their existing operations and, and integrate those into a connected world? Um, so, so yeah, so that's kind of where it went, but I'm glad I had that engineering background because I, if I was either selling something, um, an idea or even a product, uh, I, I would be able to speak with conviction and credibility and, and there was no BS involved. It, it, and I would sometimes even tell folks, you know, we just can't do what you need. You may want to go talk to this other company and, you know, they're, they would be our, our big competitor. And um, but what I would do, it would seem like I'm just saying, God, I'm I'm sorry. So I, um, I think I talked over you. No, that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just following you so carefully because uh, this is like <laughs> confirming my, 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 my expectations about how things yeah. went there. It sounds right. like, <clears throat> yes, you, you could not have done all that stuff uh, if you hadn't started with hands-on engineering. Um, and then, yeah. you know, you learn about the business, the business grows around you, uh, yeah. you meet uh, others, uh, you understand marketing and development, you understand personnel, you understand mm -hmm. venture capital, uh, you understand management, uh, and before you know it, you're a global strategy guy. Um, <laughs> right. what, what an incredible art that is. <laughs> you know, it strikes me that what you, what you haven't mentioned is uh, the importance of being able to articulate exactly what the technology is, exactly what the mission is, exactly what the, you know, the, the global strategy is, and also, um, you, you know, human relations, personal relations, uh, uh, you uh -huh. have to have that too. Uh, and whether right. you have it at the beginning or you develop it along the way, you really have to have it over time to succeed right. in Silicon Valley. Am I right? I think so. Uh, and I'll tell you uh, just a, a short story. And again, I know I'm talking a lot, so I apologize. I'm kind of carrying too much of this conversation. But uh, this was early on at Daisy Systems. I was about 23. And uh, one, of the, um, one of the folks over in marketing who I really looked up to, I mean, I just looked up to this guy. And he said, Dave, have you ever considered getting into sales and marketing? I said, no, I don't like those people. <laughs> and then I realized he was like a, you know, a VP. And I said, but I like you. I don't mean that. I don't mean I don't like you. But I really didn't. I, had, I just did not. I had an aversion to the, to the marketing folks and the sales folks because they didn't really know what they were doing. And they weren't really engineers. Um, but later, I, I realized that you can have a great product um, and great engineering. And if you can't market it, you're going to die. You can have a quasi okay product. And if you market the hell out of it, you're going to be super successful. So I started realizing that, that it really does come down to being able to get that product to market. But um, they had asked if I wanted to go to Japan uh, and, and speak about a, a product that we had just developed called the Logician. And uh, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be so cool. We're going to go to, uh, go to Tokyo. So, so I'm on a plane and get over there. And I'm speaking not to a huge group, but about 150 people. And I want to, I'm thinking that I, I really want to fit in, you know, I really want to, so I practice how to say, um, uh, good morning, my name is Dave Douglas, and so-and-so is going to, to um, translate for me. And so I worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. Basically what I said when I, when I, <laughs> when I threw it out there was, uh, hello, my name is Dave Douglas, and I'm going to go do onagi with this chick. <laughs> And, and it was the, you know, like eat sushi and, um, and I completely blew it. And after that, I, I was like, okay, I'm never going to try this again. Um, but being a young, dumb idiot, um, I thought I'd try another one. And this was with a group of uh, about 15 or 18 engineers from, from Seiko. Now Seiko is a watch company, right? You wouldn't think they'd be selling really high end quarter million dollar, you know, types of systems, but in Japan, you need to have a distributor back then you really needed a distributor to get into those markets and seiko was an amazing company they they did all sorts of stuff they didn't just make watches so anyway they were our distributor we had about 18 engineers and i was going to be talking about the product and what it did and it just so happened that back then and when you flip on a switch especially of a, a really heavy duty computing system it goes through its post and it does this and it checks the memory and it you know, it checks the drive and and so you hear all these tests going on before the anything fires up on the screen. And you would hear beep, boop, beep, doop, and you'd hear all these different sounds. And um, so I told the same translator who I'd messed up with in the in the in the in the larger um, discussion that I had earlier the day before, 
I said, okay, so we're basically just, just translate everything I say right when I say it. And so um, she, she's like, oh, okay, Mr. douglas son. So I was like, okay, great. So the engineers are there and I flipped the switch. Now I know how many seconds it's gonna take for it to complete post. It's gonna be about 30 or 40 seconds, something like that. So I said, uh, hello, my name is Dave Douglas. And then I look at her and she goes, da, 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 da. And then I said, I'd like to introduce you to R2D2. Now, Star Wars was huge back then. Star Wars was like really cool. What had come out in 78, Jay? I can't remember, but 77, Sounds right. Sounds Jay, right. somewhere. Uh -huh. So where everybody knew, everyone around the world knew Star Wars and everybody thought R2-D2 was like the coolest little robot in the world. And the logician happened to be kind of rounded. So I said, um, I'd like to introduce you to R2-D2. And then she looks at me and I said, R2-D2. Again, yeah, I just kind of smiled at her and she goes, da 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 R2-D2. And after she said that, the logician, like on cue, just went beep, do 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 and started making these noises. Oh, and the perfect. Engineers, all the engineers thought it was magic. They were talking to each other and just battling back and forth. So it was pretty cool. Um, pretty cool. Yeah, just kind of yeah. silliness. But but yeah, they just actually- Just as easily that. though it could have failed, I suppose. Well, yeah. It, uh, yeah. And, but see, that's one of the problems too. I think I always swung for the fence and uh, I never really hit a home run, but I always swung for the fence. And, and I got to say Silicon Valley- for me at the time was just a great, it was a great situation because it allowed me to swing for the fence. Um, well, that, that goes to a question I wanted to ask you, which we touched on actually in the, in the cafe, cafe restaurant show. A couple <laughs> right. Ago. Yeah. And that is <clears throat> Silicon Valley has changed. And I wanted to ask you about the change. I mean, the, you describe pretty much what's in halt and catch fire. You describe yeah. this incredible adventure experience and you know you could get in there and if you were quick-witted and you were willing to work hard my yeah. god the world was your oyster you were in the most exciting industry sector location in the country in the yeah. world now it's different isn't it what's the change i think it is different i i think what happened was uh, uh, silicon valley became mainstream to be perfectly frank it uh, there was a time when a lot of people didn't really know of silicon valley didn't even know where it was what it was and it had the ability to operate under a cloak of secrecy. You know, skunk works could easily be going on that no one would even know about. Now it's like, um, I think some of the changes is people may come up with an app or they may come up with some different things, but for the most part, um, most of the exits are, it'll be acquired by one of the big guys. And so I, I think what's happened is that we've got this, these ubiquitous, these companies that have product that's just ubiquitous across the landscape. And so they kind of control the narrative in terms of you know, product and development and applications and, and how, how far they, they go. I also think, and this isn't to beat Google up at all. Google is an amazing company, has been an amazing company, but I can remember when the, the mantra for Google was don't be evil, you know, don't be evil. Well, funny enough, a lot of people kind of think Google's like, ah, they've got their hands in everything and they, they know, you know, when I'm going to eat a Big Mac. And, you know, so, so some people feel like Google's really kind of moved beyond um, and, and has their finger in the pie. But, um, but one of the things that I, I noticed early on, and I really didn't like it that much about Google, was that they never completed a product. They would develop a product and they would, they would get it out the door and their, their system of being able to get something out the door and iterate, get feedback and, and make modifications and then improve it and improve it and improve it. They didn't really have any customer service. They didn't really, uh, they used the customers to debug product, but they gave it away for free. So what it did was it kind of, and this is my own version of, of the story. I could be so far off and so wrong. And if anyone disagrees with me, I, I would agree that they should probably disagree with me. But <laughs> It seems like we created this generation of folks who were perfectly happy with stuff that didn't really work that well because it was free. And, and that disappointed me because I remember back in, you know, back when I was a kid, um, we would build product that had, it was, it was focused, it was targeted, the usability was taken care of. And it was really something that I, like I say, changed the world. It would really be amazing. Like the iPhone really did change the world. And it was an amazing product. I mean, amazing. And did it have some shortcomings? Yes. But at the end of the day, 
And I think that was kind of the end of the, the glory years in terms of product going out the door. And, and now we see a lot of product that's kind of thrown together and they got to get it out really fast. And so I think, um, I think a lot of things have changed in terms of culture and uh, just the, the ability to create product, create new um, uh, technologies and, and be able to have as a small company go public and stay that small company. It, it, you just can't hardly do that anymore. Yeah, so your experience, the experience you had, um, you could not have that now, am I right? I don't think so. I think it's different, but you know, I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's great for the, the folks who are there because, you know, I told, um, I was talking to someone a few months back and I said that I, I have this theory that it doesn't matter if you're working for Jiffy Lube or if you're working for Google, um, the years between 18 and 24 or 25 are probably some of the most amazing years of your entire life because everything's new. You're either going to college or you're going to work or you're in the military or, but it's just life is new and you're an adult and every single thing you do is amazing. So I'm sure that the folks who are in Silicon Valley right now would argue with me and that's great that they should. They should say, hey, you're just an old guy. It's all over for you that, that those times are over. And, uh, and I would just smile back and say, yeah, maybe they're over, but I lived them and they were pretty amazing. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and, and made some history. So, yeah. but you know, there's a whole, there's a whole thing about a career, a career path and uh, ultimately you kind of graduate somehow. I'm yeah. sure a lot of the successful uh, entrepreneurs, engineers in Silicon Valley got to be venture capitalists. Uh, you know, with their own experience, their own money and so forth. Yeah, they did. Like Harvey Jones is a great example. He is one of the founders of Daisy and he started his own his own firm. And there's a lot of folks that became angel investors where they would take a project and just put in their own their own personal money. Others actually, Vinod actually started his own fund. Um, so, yeah, so it's it's pretty cool to see kind of where things go in terms of the the old guard moving in and kind of helping the young guard you know, the new folks come in and, um, and start up new, you know, new companies. So, and some of them, yeah. some of them graduate into uh, restaurants in Maui. <laughs> this was supposed to be a retirement. I don't think I've ever worked as hard as I have <laughs> running this coffee shop. It, I thought I was going to sit outside and drink espresso and talk to people. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit different than that. But it, again, I tend to be passionate about whatever I do. And, and I love it. I love being at the cafe it's a lot of fun. We've uh, we've really uh, put a lot of love into it, and and we now have this amazing local community following that that uh, that, that we enjoy every single day. So I think I, you'll I, ever do tech again. What's that? Will you ever do tech again? Oh my gosh, probably not. And uh, if I did, it would just be from a consulting perspective. I tried to leave when I was 40, 39, 40. I tried to kind of walk away. I said, you know what, I'm done. I don't really need to keep doing, you know, I, I, I just think I'm going to take some time off. Maybe when Joe, the character back in, in the show, maybe when he was starting to get some scruples and, you know, I went through a little bit of that and um, I was with a company as a senior vice president. It was a 4,000 person company and I reported to the CEO and there was a merger that, that took place. And I was going to lose about half of my reports. And I had a few VPs underneath me. And I just didn't want to go through that. And they wanted me to move to New York. And I just, I just didn't want to go through um, that process. So I had a six-month severance in place. And I said, you know, guys, I thank you very much. But I think I'm going to take my six-month severance. So I was just turning 40 at the time. And I thought, I'm going to go see the highest mountain in the world. So I, I uh, went to REI and bought a backpack and a bunch of things. and. Uh, got on an airplane and, and landed in Kathmandu and you know, it was like, okay, where's Everest? And uh, it was great. It was just exciting. And what was supposed to only be a couple of months turned out to me traveling literally around the world for two and a half years, just traveled all over the world. No rhyme or reason. It wasn't like I went to Ken, you know, went to Nepal and went to uh, Bhutan and then went over to India and then maybe worked my way uh, down to Thailand and Thailand to Cambodia. I didn't do that. I I went to Nepal, then to Thailand, then to Spain, then to London, then down to Cambodia, then over to Argentina. <laughs> wow, and it was trip. just, it was awesome. And, and then I'd go back home and see the family for Christmas. But, uh, but it was two and a half years of travel. And I just That'll wanted to- clear your head. <laughs> it did, but I just wanted to go until I got tired, until I just didn't want to travel anymore. And it, it did take about 
two and a half years and one of the greatest times in my life. I'm but sure. then when I went back, I um, was doing some consulting and, you know, I was just going to kind of put my dip my toe into it. And uh, but next thing I knew, I was, you know, full tilt. And I think I was in Hamburg or somewhere. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm back in. I'm back, you know, going going full tilt. My hair's on fire. And I'm just go, 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 go. And, and so I, I kind of came to the conclusion that I was going to move to the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> and so they can't get me here. So, uh, so I moved to Hawaii and, and bought a coffee shop. Um, but, uh, but yeah, but it, it's all repeating. I'm, I'm now the vice president of the Maui Coffee Association and I'm on the board of, uh, of the Lahaina Town Action Committee. And I just, I don't know what my problem is. I just can't, I can't just take it easy and sit down and have that, that little espresso and, and talk with people. I, I have to keep Oh, it's 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 swinging well for the fence. DNA I just right I just now, keep yeah. swinging for the fence. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm really delighted that you could talk about this with me. I'm, I, it's a great conversation. I'm I'm just tickled pink. Well, it Let was me fun. You, you took me down memory question. lane. Yeah, well, there's a lot there. Well, let me <laughs> ask you one last question, Dave. You yeah. know, since since John Burns, the governor who was early in the uh, I guess the '60s after statehood, you know, and every governor mm -hmm. thereafter. Mm -hmm. There's always been this aspiration to diversify the economy away from tourism, yeah, uh, and and restaurants. I might have, um, <laughs> right? But you know, to to and diversification is is another word, a euphemistic word, um, <laughs> for for technology, right? It's sure. always been the case. And as yeah. we see agriculture go down, you know, you know, go down, decline. It's really quite declined now. Yeah. Um, you know, people look longingly at the possibilities they never. They never took advantage of and we never did establish a, a tech sector so my yeah. question to you is given all that experience and given what you learned there and and what you thought about while you're traveling around looking back at you know the the, the heyday of your of your of your um, avocation um do you think that hawaii has a, a a chance even a remote chance of establishing a kind of junior silicon valley it's interesting you, you ask say that. no if you want it's interesting you ask that. I believe that if Hawaii chooses to accept the baton, um, Hawaii has a destiny in technology. And but it's up to Hawaii. It's up to Hawaii and the people of Hawaii because the the, the silver lining of, around COVID is that you know what we can work remotely. Now one of the challenges that a lot of companies would have let's just go back 10 years. We don't even have to go back seven or eight months, but 10 years ago, um, the challenge would be like, well, you're gonna be in Hawaii and you're just gonna be goofing off and going to the beach every day. And you know, you're not gonna get anything done. But now what they realize is through COVID is that people can work from home. They can hit deadlines. They can do a lot of things. And I think that right now, right now today is the time for Hawaii to really jump on the bandwagon and say, live in paradise, and still be able to work remotely. And, and technology is a great, um, I mean, it just lends itself to being able to do that. So, so the answer is an emphatic yes, but it really comes down to Hawaii and it comes down to the leadership and it comes down to the, um, to the politicians and the local you know, folks. You know, is this something they want? But if it is, and I personally think they should aggressively go after it, um, it it's ripe right now. And right now is I think the time, who wouldn't wanna live on Maui or on Oahu or Kauai, who would not want to live and, and still get their work done? But at the end of the day, and the great thing about out here is that you can get your work done when the work day is over, you can go grab your board and, and hit the water. So it, this is actually a really amazing place. And I think it lends itself to a, to a, a, a technology. It could be a, a, like another Silicon Valley or a technology Mecca where you have amazingly uh, talented people that are living in paradise and still working jobs that are um, that are contributing to the GDP. Well, I hope we can talk to you about this again. Um, okay, you're, you're a valuable great. resource, even just to schmooze with. And let me and let me remind you also that Joe McMillan in San Francisco, working in Silicon Valley, uh -huh. surfed every day. <laughs> well, again, I used to I used to go out to Fort Point where he was surfing. It was at Fort Point right underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and I've 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 uh, taken that uh, left handed break many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank
Thank you, Dave. Dave Douglas, okay. what a great discussion. Thank Thanks, you so Jim. much. It was for really coming. great. Talk to you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Aloha. Bye-bye.